Hey. <laughs> I think we're on. I'm we're so blown away by that intro. Was, it was really cool. I know. I was like, have you I, seen that? <laughs> I haven't seen that before, no. It was like a trailer. It was an yeah, awful, I like, love that. <laughs> I wonder how I could get a hold of that. Um, hello, so everyone. Welcome to Barnes & Noble's Midday Mystery. My name is Rachel Harrison. I'm the author of Black Sheep, Such Sharp Teeth, Cackle, and The Return. Uh, my next novel, So Thirsty, is out. September 10th. It's available for pre-order. Uh, I've heard a rumor that Barnes and Noble's having a pre-order sale for members, 25% off. Um, but the star of our midday mystery is you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Nick Medina, born in Chicago, Illinois. Nick Medina has gone in search of Resurrection Mary, the Italian Bride, the Devil Baby, and other Windy City ghosts. An enthusiast of local and native lore, his debut novel, Sisters of the Lost Nation, features several supernatural myths and legends. His stellar sophomore novel, Indian Burial Ground, does as well. It's out now from Berkeley. Nick, how are you? I am doing great. And I want to start off just by saying thank you for doing this for me. I, I can't tell you how grateful I am. Uh, this is the coolest thing I've gotten to do. Uh, but yeah, it's been a fun week. Indian Burial Ground came out on Tuesday. Uh, been surfing the high of you know, so many people wishing me well, sending in, uh, you know, uh, congratu congratulations and all kinds of stuff. So it's been pretty cool. A little bit tired, but uh, it's been a fun <laughs> week. Always a lot to go, or always a lot to do on pub week. Yeah, just Pretty overstimulated from <laughs> yeah. generally. The introvert in me is getting a little worn out, but overall, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I relate. Um, yeah. To kick us off. <laughs> Okay. Uh, can you tell us about Indian Burial Ground in your own words, your, your quick pitch of the novel? Yeah, of course. So Indian Burial Ground focuses on two key characters. We have Noemi, who is 40 years old. She is kind of down on her luck, but she's, you know, she's found a new boyfriend and she's looking uh, to the future. But all of a sudden, things take a turn for the worse. Her boyfriend ends up dead. It's not clear if it's an accident or a suicide. And right around the same time, our other key figure, who is Louis, Noemi's uncle, returns to the reservation, and he himself has lived through some pretty horrific events when he was a teenager, and uh, some of those events include some unexplained murders, or not murders, I should say deaths, and um, now he's starting to wonder if Noemi's boyfriend's death is related to the things that happened to him as a child, so Together, Noemi and Louis have to figure out what's going on as they also try to figure out themselves. Because really, at the core of this book, um, it's about loss, pain, trauma, you know, the things that we try to bury inside of ourselves and the things that sometimes come back. And when they do come back, they're not often very pretty. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a story about family bonds, intergenerational inter, uh, uh, trauma, and uh, like I said, the things that come back to haunt us. That was beautifully put. <laughs> and I told you when I, I finished the book, I, I closed it and I was like, all right, I'm going to wait until I have something articulate to say about how much I loved it. And then I just like a few days went by and I was like, it's just going to be gushing. I'm just going to have to <laughs> accept that I can't be articulate about this book because it's so good. Um, but I've been really looking forward to this conversation because as I was reading, I kept making notes about things I wanted to talk to you about. Um, so first things first, I wanted to ask you about the origin story for this book. Mm -hmm. um, it's got such an like metal iconic title. Did the title come first and you build the story around it? Did it come, the idea come from somewhere else? Yeah, I, I wish I had the title early, but uh, honestly I didn't. The title was, the, pretty much the last thing that we, we nailed down. And uh, it took a long time to find a title. I had, of course, a working title that I, I really liked. And for a while, we thought maybe we would go with it. But then ultimately, we decided something else would be better. So uh, me and, and my publisher, we were just throwing back and forth ideas. And it was going on for a really long time. And then eventually, we got to the point where uh, my editor said, hey, we need a title by Wednesday. You have to nail it down by Wednesday. And so of course, I was stressing out about it, trying to come up with ideas. Wednesday comes, I didn't have anything. Um, <laughs> then the editor said, we'll, we'll wait till Friday, but it has to be Friday. So 
two more days of stressing, trying to come up with ideas. I submitted a few more. Uh, those didn't quite work out. And, you know, everything that was coming at me from the publisher side as well didn't seem to really gel with me. So we just weren't clicking. And I had to say again, you know, what? it's it's just not right. We don't have it yet. And they said, <laughs> thankfully, they said, uh, we'll give you till Monday morning, but that's the latest we can go. And so, of course, all weekend, I was just thinking about it, trying to come up with ideas. Uh, Sunday comes, I still didn't have anything. I was lying in bed Sunday morning, and uh, you know, I, I was I was pretty I was pretty torn up about it. It was really getting me down because I I, I wanted it to be right, but I just I didn't want to settle for something that I didn't feel um, you know worked for me. And of course, I wanted to give the publisher something they would be happy with as well. So. As I was lying there in bed, I just started thinking about what the book is about, started thinking about all the themes, where it takes place, the time frame, 1980s for one of the timelines. And uh, it was just like a bolt of lightning. It just struck, it just Indian burial ground popped into my head. And then I remember feeling excited by it, but also a little nervous about it because there's so much attached to that trope. And, you know, there's, there's so many, um, you know, no notions connected with it. Uh, but I wrote up a little paragraph saying why I thought I think it would make a great title. I submitted it and uh, it was unanimous. Everyone seemed to agree. So um, I, I was grateful for that. But yeah, the story itself came over several years. Um, I think my first inkling for it was back in 2012, actually. I read an article about a little boy who supposedly sat up in his coffin and asked his father for water and then fell back down dead. And uh, that always stuck with me, that, that story. And so I wanted to do something with it. And, uh, you know, that that was the the spark, I guess. And then over several years, it just kept growing and growing and ultimately turned into this. The title story was giving me secondhand anxiety. <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, I'm so glad <laughs> your publisher was probably, it was so, our publisher was probably so relieved when you came back with this epic title. Did in any way feel like a reclamation of you know, that trope? Yeah, it once, and, and that was the thing, it felt almost like I had been, I had been writing for that title the entire time because there were so many things that seemed to just fit with, with those words, but also putting a spin on those words because of course, uh, you know, there are some stereotypes attached to the Indian burial ground trope. And then once I did settle on it, um, I did go back into the story and kind of tighten things up and to try to really, you know, reclaim those words, like you said, and and try to give it a different meaning so that, um, you know, we can kind of turn turn that trope and the stereotypes around and uh, give it a different take, different twist. I think you did a beautiful job. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to get into folklore, um, like the Dakota Vampire. Um, folklore is front and center in both of your books, in Sisters of the Lost Nation and in Indian Burial Ground. Can you speak to how you incorporate it into your novels? And let me just say, so every time I walk by brush now, and I feel like I've told you this a few times, and like something moves in the brush, I freak out Good. <laughs> from Sisters of the Lost Nation. And now with Indian Burial Ground, every time there's like a tap at my window, I'm like someone's throwing oh. rocks at my window, it's game over. So... Just well, thank you for the fear, the I lingering fear I have from your folklore. I take that as a compliment. But <laughs> speaking of the rolling head, I don't know if you can see it here, but there's an artist rendition right here of it. Oh my, That's now I mean. have a visual, this is worse. <laughs> what might be chasing you in the brush, should I put it away? Uh, but yeah, folklore is just something that I really love. Uh, I love reading it and I love getting a chance to create my own folklore within these books. Uh, when it comes to traditional native folklore, I like to use it as a tool. It's, I think it's something that helps the characters because these, these native stories have always been around. You know, they've always been a part of these characters' lives, but they don't always know what to take from those stories. So um, like with in Indian Burial Ground, I used an origin story, an origin myth of the Dakota tribe, which I adapted from the Blackfeet Nation. And so that's a story that our main characters know their entire lives, but they don't always know, um, you know, what what it truly means until they get to a, a point in their lives where they have to dissect it and, and take um, take something away from it that's going to help them. So I like just like with uh, Sisters of the Lost Nation and with Indian Burial Ground, I like to use that folklore to help 
the characters figure out what's what's behind the mysteries on the reservations. That's fascinating. I never thought of it like that, where it's just such a part of these characters' lives that, you know, the stories that we have that we're born with, that we grow up hearing, we just sort of take for granted. And it's only when things happen in our lives that put them into perspective that we kind of challenge and ask questions about the story or dig deeper into these these stories. That's so, the beautiful thing I think about folklore is that it can be interpreted in so many different ways. It can have so many different meanings for so many different people. And yeah, it, it can really have an impact on where you're going in life. And that's the point of a lot of folklore, a lot of native folklore, especially, uh, you know, it's, it's there to show you where you were in the past. And it's also there to help you determine where you're going in the future. Yeah. It's, and it's also from a craft perspective, just a brilliant tool for yeah. character development. So it works on a lot both of levels. I find it fascinating. I can read yeah. you know, those stories all day. And always find something different in them. And that's the other fun thing too. I'll be reading something and all of a sudden it'll just click and I'll know exactly how to use it within a story. Uh, that kind of happened with Sisters of the Lost Nation. Um, I used the story about two sisters and made a, made a story about two sisters, which features the rolling head, but it fit almost perfectly with what was going on in the real world and with you know young women and girls going missing. And I had read an article about two, two sisters and that's what really gave me the idea for it. Um, sisters of the Lost Nation. So having that real life article about these two sisters enduring this horrible uh, situation and then reading uh, the, the tale of the two sisters, it just fit together so perfectly. So this transitions nicely into genre because it seems like you get inspiration from true life events. Like you said, the article about the boy sitting up in his coffin and these two sisters. Yeah. Your work is such an incredible blend of genre. There's horror, there's mystery, there's suspense, folklore, and then true crime. Do you think about genre when you write or do you just sit down and whatever happens, happens? Yeah, it's just pretty much uh, the story just goes where it wants to go. I never really sit down and say, hey, I'm gonna write. Uh, even though I like dark things and, and horror, I never really sit down and say, hey, I'm gonna write a horror story. Uh, oddly enough, I'm working on something new right now and it started off feeling very literary. And I, I didn't think there was gonna be uh, a lot of speculative stuff in it. And now that I'm about a month into it, it's taken on so many different uh, twists and turns and different genres, like you said. But yeah, it just kind of happens. I let the story determine itself and, and the characters go where they need to go and do what they need to do. And um, you know, that was actually something that surprised me with Sisters of the Lost Nation. When I started uh, first getting like advanced reviews and people were commenting about it, I started seeing all these different labels attached to it and they were a bunch of labels I had never even thought of like people saying it was gothic and uh, you know it, it just took me by surprise because I hadn't even stopped to think about what it was it was just a story you know that that seemed to exist somehow so I, I don't know it's kind of weird that way yeah I think genre are more for marketers and readers yeah. <laughs> and as authors you know we want to be aware of it but I think the more you try and write to a genre or stay in one place, you might limit the story because oh, you're like, sure. well, I want this to be a horror story, but the story might not want to be a horror yeah, story. You can't so, force it. You gotta let it just be what yeah. it is. And sometimes maybe that is problematic because it is hard to classify. And I know, you know, publishers and, and uh bookstores want the want the clear classification, but I don't know. I tend not to think about it too much until yeah. maybe later and I get asked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then after, once the book is done, then we can be like, I should have yeah. thought more about genre. <laughs> um, but, you know, in addition to like the genre elements of your work, there's deeper themes that run through both of your novels. And with Indian Burial Ground, like you said, this is really a book about generational trauma. Um, and we get into suicide rates and addiction and substance abuse in native communities. And I was wondering if you could speak to why you wanted to raise awareness about these issues in this novel. Yeah, I, I wanted to address those things because these are issues that have been plaguing native communities and indigenous communities for decades, and they're not getting better. 
you know, usually you, you think and hope that over time these problems would be uh, improving, but they're not. And cur currently, um, the, the rates or the statistics released by the Centers for Disease and Disease Control and Prevention over the last few years show that uh, suicide within Native communities is not only the highest in the country among all ethnic and cultural groups, but it's the highest it's ever been, especially among younger natives, you know, teenagers and young adults. And also another surprising statistic was that firearm related suicides are up 66%. So these are the highest these numbers have ever been. And uh, like I said, they're not, they're not showing any sign of improvement. And so I just thought it was really important to shine some light on that and maybe hopefully bring a little attention to uh, these problems without being too preachy about it, with, you know, just trying to trying to give the audience a good time with the book, but also exposing them to something that they might not have been aware of before. And uh, hopefully, whether it's through this book or something else, hopefully some answers will be found because uh, right now, I, I think the biggest problem is that a lot of tribes don't have the resources, they don't have the voice, uh, they, they need more attention. So, um, it, you know, any, anything that we can do to bring a little attention to it, I think is helpful. Well, I think you handled it beautifully. It's a perfect balance of, um, you know, raising awareness about these things and, and shining a light to it. And I, it's not preachy at all. And there's the perfect balance of, you know, deeper themes and an emotional center of the book, but it's also, it is very entertaining and compelling. Um, and I appreciate you being willing to talk about that. Um, but it was a heavy question and I don't want to bog us down. <laughs> so I was wondering if before we get into uh, viewer Q and A, if you would do a fun, a few fun, would you rather's with me? Course, Are you game? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> All right. Would you rather be at a funeral where the corpse pops up out of the coffin or in the most boring three hour meeting of your life? It's gotta be an easy one. Uh, I don't know what I would get out of the most boring meeting of my life. I have to go with the corpse popping out of the coffin. Uh, that would at least give me something to talk about for forever, probably <laughs> something uh, that uh, I could probably capture some imaginations with, but also, I think, um, you know, that's got to be that's nightmare fuel. That's writer fuel. That's something I could I could maybe uh, pay some bills with. So yeah, definitely want to be at the at the funeral with the corpse popping out of the coffin. I just saw Erica T. Worth, who's a brilliant, uh, brilliant writer, say Erica. corpse, corpse, corpse. <laughs> um, of course, I think all of us are. Yeah. Are the corpse. Um, would you rather? have a ghost in your attic or a vampire in your basement? That's a good one because those are two two entities that I'm fascinated by and which I've written about and which I love. Uh, but I, I think it would have to be ghost because I'm pretty certain or I'm pretty convinced that vampires don't actually exist, but I'm not sure yet about ghosts. And I, I think that could help me with you know, if, if I had a ghost in the attic and I could actually experience it, and uh, I think that could help me with issues of faith and you know, figuring out maybe what happens after we die, I think I could maybe get more out of that. That is a fascinating answer. I never in a million years would have thought of that. <laughs> I love I that know. you're like going upstairs but to the attic to be like, let's talk about the afterlife, buddy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, can you, yeah, if it can show me something, I think that would, uh, you know, enhance some of my beliefs and help me figure some things out. But I've also always been fascinated by ghosts ever since I was a little kid. That's something I've always kind of chased, uh, you know, wanting that solid, conclusive um, experience that shows me that ghosts exist. And I know so many people who have no no question of doubt and, and they believe wholeheartedly but uh, i still struggle with that so i think it'd be pretty cool to all right ghost in the attic. <laughs> all Please right last one <laughs> um would you rather happen upon a disturbed grave or bones in the riverbed i would go disturbed grave because i love cemeteries i'm known for kind of 
exploring cemeteries. Even when I travel, I'll, I'll check out the local cemetery, see if there are any good ghost stories connected to them. Uh, and I think that would just feel like walking into one of those old time universal, you know, monster movies like Frankenstein. Like, why is this? Why is this grave dug up? What happened to the body parts? Is there a monster walking around? With, you know. I'm guessing you're fast. Are you a fast runner? Because <laughs> only people who are fast would be like, I'd stick around. Stick around. I'll check this out. And see where <laughs> yeah. this is going. Uh, I don't know, but yeah, I think that I think that would be pretty. I mean, it's also one of those things that gives you a really good story. I think open grave in a cemetery is kind of better than just random bones in a riverbed. It's, you're you know, just after the stories. There, That's what we've learned about you. From this. About your, what, what would you go with for that one? Uh, maybe bones because I'm not fast like if there was a if there was a monster like that's it for me it's game over so you're, you're the queen of monsters. you write every monster yeah but like I don't want to see on one I might want to be one okay. but I don't want to come across one I'm a wimp um, <laughs> um all right so I want to get into some viewer Q&As, we got a ton of really just fantastic questions for you. So um, let's dive right in, you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Aniko asks, do you plot and know the main points before you start to write? So yeah, plotter or pantser? I am a plotter. I have to have everything figured out. It's, even if it, you know, ultimately most of the stuff does end up changing, or I should say a lot of the stuff ends up changing as I'm working on it. but. I don't feel secure starting something until I have a really solid outline and know where I'm headed. Uh, I always focus a lot on the ending first. I always want to know what my finish line is, what my goal is. Uh, I, I find that that really helps me figure out what the characters need to do, what they need to go through, and, and what events I need to spotlight in the book. Uh, so yeah, I definitely have to have a really good idea of the, the big things that are going to happen. I'm jealous. <laughs> I wish I was a better outliner. <laughs> um, Jillian asks, what led you to focus on indigenous stories in your writing? Well, I, I, I am part of a tribe called the Tunica Biloxi tribe of Louisiana. So that definitely played a part and, and it gave me a lot of stuff to uh, kind of kind of draw from and a lot of inspiration. And uh, it also just seemed like a really cool unique take for, for some some of my stories i don't remember exactly 100 percent uh the first time why i decided to write uh about native native things um you know with sisters of lost nation that one was pretty clear because i had read an article about two native sisters who uh, like i said were going or one of the sisters was missing and uh, the other sister was searching for her. So that one clearly obviously had to be set in the world of, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, natives. But I had actually written before that, and that's that's when I came up with the reservation that I set sisters on. I already kind of had that in my back pocket because I had started writing a story before uh, sisters. So I just continued with that. Uh, but yeah, I don't remember the, the exact reason why. It just... I guess it was something I was interested in. And like I said, was influenced by with my own family stuff. Um, from Kara, what made you decide to write horror and what elements slash tropes are your favorite in the horror yeah. genre? <laughs> so, so, I mean, like I said earlier, I, I, I've always been drawn to kind of darker things, spooky things. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I remember some of the first things that I read were like, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark by Alvin Schwartz. And I was of the Goosebumps generation. So I got to read all of those books when they were coming out brand new. And uh, it just seemed like a natural thing, natural thing for me. It was just something that I was always drawn to. And uh, some of the tropes I love, I love a good haunted house story. I love the cabin in the woods type stories. I love ghosts, um, vampires, anything real. I mean, I love them all. <laughs> They're all great. Can't pick. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's tough to pick. There's so many great horror tropes that it's hard to just nail them down. Yeah, I'm the same. Um, Matthew asks, as you write these books, where do you get your inspiration? And does that inspiration change from story to story? Now, a lot of my inspiration does come from just reading, reading other 
uh, authors, reading a lot of news articles. Almost everything that I've written so far has stemmed from some some news article that I've come across, and which makes me, uh, you know, kind of stop and think and wonder. Uh, I often find that the real horror comes from real life stuff. It's not really the monsters and you know the the, the even the folklore that gives us most of the horror, in my opinion. I think it's what humans do to each other and uh, you know the human monster that's the scariest. So that's where I get a lot of my inspiration. And yeah, it does change from story to story. Uh, you know, it just happens or whatever I happen to come across and, and whatever's kind of eating my mind at that moment. I usually fixate on something. And, uh, if I can't get it off my mind, then I, I usually know that's a sign that I have to write about it or include it in whatever I'm working on. Um, this is a great question. I was just thinking about Earn because doesn't Earn say to Louie, it's people, Louie, mm -hmm. like about, um, but yeah. Rachel asks, who is your favorite character that you have created in your book and why? Oh, and I love cool. Earn, which I probably yeah. like, I don't know, I have a soft spot for weirdos, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you know, what? I do love Earn too. He was one of the really fun characters to write. Uh, and, and just to clarify, Earn is a character in Indian oh, yeah. burial ground. Uh, I won't give away too much about him, but he, like uh, Rachel said, kind of, kind of a weirdo, kind of an odd duck. Uh, so yeah, he was really fun to write. Uh, trying to get into a different headspace and explore, uh, you know, what might be odd about him and and, and odd about his situation. Uh, he is one of the uniquer characters I think that I've ever written, and uh, I'll leave it as a surprise as to why he's unique and what makes him unique. Uh, but I also had a lot of fun writing the mythological parts of Indian Burial Ground, where I got to write about this vampire that you referenced earlier, the Dakota vampire. And the vampire itself isn't necessarily a, a, a solid character. It's more of a referenced character. It's part of that mythology. And uh, so it was a lot of fun kind of creating that and writing that and bringing the vampire to life in its own way. I love a vampire. Very scary. <laughs> um, there were a few great questions about your writing process. So I kind of melded them together and just, can you tell us about your writing process, what it looks like, your timeline for a novel, your day-to-day -day routine? Uh, I usually, well, like I said, I always start with outlining. I like to have everything put into place. So I'll spend maybe months sometimes working on an outline just depends on how long it takes for everything to come together but then once I have that outline you know really solid and I feel confident with it usually writing the the first draft of the manuscript doesn't take more than three to four months I always once I start something I don't like to stop so I'll write every day and I always shoot for like a minimum of a thousand words that makes me feel comfortable knowing that I got at least a good chunk done. So, you know, if you're if you're shooting for an average novel, you know, you can finish it in three months or so. And uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty disciplined. I write every single day, even weekends. I don't really give myself time off, but why would I? It's a fun job. I love doing it. So, and I feel really lucky to get to do it and, and to be able to focus on it the way I have. Um, I don't know. I, I think that's pretty much it. Just me sitting in this room right here. It's my desk behind me alone for hours <laughs> at a time. I, I think that's the other thing. You have to be pretty disciplined and be able to shut yourself off from the rest of the world for uh, a good good chunk of time to get things done. Do you listen to music when you write? No, I, I recently with, um, I just finished the manuscript that I submitted earlier this month, but uh, before that one, I would always write in silence. But with that one, I started experimenting a little bit and listening to things like binaural beats. Like I found some binaural beats that are supposed to inspire nightmares. <laughs> so I thought that would be a good idea to kind of go into the darker realm. It didn't make me have any nightmares, but maybe it helped. I also started listening to like brown noise, which is supposed to help you focus. And um, I, I've actually been using that a lot lately. I, I find that it does help just kind of block things out because sometimes you know, I'll hear something outside the window or there's traffic or whatever. So just having that noise keeps it, or keeps me from getting distracted. Um, there were a few questions about research. Do you research for your novels at all? What does that look like? Yeah, I tend to do quite a bit of research. I, I like to 
really find out or, or try to try to reflect as much of the real world as I can and try to, especially since I'm addressing a lot of issues that are, um, you know, big issues and, and devastating issues to a lot of people. I want to make sure that I reflect those issues accurately. So like with Sisters of the Lost Nation, I did a ton of reading about families who are missing, um, you know, one of their, their family members, their, their sisters, their daughters, their mothers. Uh, and and that, that can be really tough, you know, constantly reading about those things and being surrounded by that topic for months on end. Uh, with, with something that I just finished writing, I did the same thing, right? I was just constantly reading and watching um, documentaries and um, actually YouTube channels as well. I don't want to give away what that one's about, but there's a lot of people who post their daily um, lives with the issue that I'm addressing. And so I was able to really kind of immerse myself in, in what it's like for these people to live with that issue day in and day out. And uh, like I said, it can get really tough because it just plays on your mind and you're constantly thinking about it. But yeah, I like to try to reflect things as accurately as I can. So I do as much research as I can. How do you, or can you like pull yourself out of that that place? Because I imagine like you were saying, it gets kind of dark. Is there like a funny movie that you watch or do you kind of just seep in the yeah, you know, topic? You know, I really, like at the end of the day, I try to escape through things that are much lighter. Uh, I've seen you post before about the Bake Off series. I find that that is a great series to help <laughs> kind of escape from the horror realm because it's just kind of lighthearted and, and uh, it also gives you that, that competition though aspect, which is what really keeps me engaged. So yeah, I'll try to find something that will take me out of it for a while, but uh, sometimes it is really hard. I was actually just talking to another writer about this not too long ago, and uh, I don't know that I took care of myself as well as I should have with the last thing that I just wrote, because uh, it was really getting into my head and, and taking me to darker places. And uh, I even think that it might have been giving me some like psychosomatic pain and things like that. But um, yeah, I, 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 I am trying to become better about taking care of myself and writing things like that. We need a new season of Bake Off. I think it's not coming out until the fall. There's a fall, summer, something like that. Yeah. I never watch them at the right time anyway, so I'm <laughs> always behind. Um, Abina asks, what was the hardest scene to write in Indian Burial Ground and why? Uh, hardest one? That might get into spoiler territory, but there's okay. one that uh, deals with loss it, it revolves around loss it comes towards the end of the book and that was just really hard to write because um, some of it was based on real life things that i've experienced and so it does bring back a lot of pain sometimes to write about things that are inspired by things that you've actually lived through um, but yeah just trying to think about the characters what they would be feeling and trying to put yourself into their shoes uh, sometimes can be pretty tough, but uh, I think that's obviously also necessary if you want it to be genuine. What was the most fun scene that you, like what, what scene did you write and feel like I'm having a great time uh, <laughs> writing that scene or any part of the novel, any character, any highlights? <laughs> yeah, what did I, uh, I like I said, I always love writing the mytholo mythological parts, the, creating that mythology. There's a part um, in, in, the, in the book where our character Louis uh, gives the background behind the story that inspired the Dakota vampire. So really coming up with that and uh, laying that out was a lot of fun. Also creating, <laughs> this is might sound contradictory to what I just said with my previous answer, but uh, getting to create fictional deaths is sometimes a lot of fun. So I got to uh, uh, create uh, a death that is linked to the vampire, the death that inspired the vampire, really. So coming up with that was a lot of fun for me, trying to make it kind of bloody and gory and surprising and all that. Uh, but yeah, any any time where I could just kind of let things fly and not have to worry about what's what's coming out coming out of me is, is a good time, I would say. It's a good writing day. Um, this is one of my favorite questions that we got, and it's from Catherine. Is who are your horror influences? 
Oh, so many of them. I'm talking to one of them right now. Uh, I'm serious. <laughs> um, of course, Stephen King, he was one of the early ones. I think for most of us, one of the first uh, horror authors that most of us will read. Um, R.L. Stein, like I said, with Goosebumps, uh, that was a very early influence. I love Stephen Graham Jones, Paul Tremblay. Um, uh, Erica's here. She wrote an awesome novel about native stuff and, and the loafa. Um, this is a, one of those questions, though, where I always freeze up and then I'll think of the answers. Yeah. So there's a million, there's so many great horror authors, and I'm constantly reading and trying to keep up with all of them and seeing what, what, what everyone is putting out there into the world. So, uh, yeah, there's no shortage of great horror writers out there. Are you reading anything? I, this is the question I always freeze up on. People are like, are you reading anything now? And I'm like, I know I am, but yeah. my mind just goes blank. But are you reading anything now? Have you read anything lately you want to shout out? Yeah, uh, well, I, I recently read um, a collection. I got to read it in advance. I think it's coming out later this year or early next year. It's called Bone Picker. And it's a collection of native stories written by a woman named Devin Mihisua. I hope I said her name correctly. But it's an amazing collection of stories. Um, a lot of them feature the things that I love, the, the mythology, mythological creatures. Uh, some of them are pretty dark. So it's a great collection. Keep an eye out for that called Bone Picker. And then I also just started a book called Pelican Girls. Um, it's by an author named Julia. I'm going to mess up her last name. Julia M. I'll just say, uh, look up Pelican Girls. But I got to meet Julia last month in New Orleans. It's, uh, it's not... The, the typical stuff that I usually read, it's not horror, but it's a it's a great book so far. I, I'm still in the early stages of it, but so far I'm really enjoying it. Those are great shout outs because I haven't heard those. I'm glad to add them to my TBR. Um, Tammy asks, where do you get your ideas for your books? But I think we might have touched on that a little bit with yeah, you know, articles and- Just reading news articles, different things that are going on in the world. Um, and then just, combine that with whatever crazy ideas pop into my head and uh, we'll see what comes out. Do you have any articles that you've read or like, cause I, I cannot believe that you read an article about a two-year-old sitting at, was he two years old? Or yeah, he's two that? years old. And that, that one actually, I still see floating around now. I think it's gaining like urban legend status, mm. um, but yeah, supposedly that one was real. I mean, it's still out there. If, it, he was a Brazilian boy. I think his name was Kel, Kelvin Santos. If anyone wants to look it up, you can find it. So. Have there been any articles that you've like read or come across that are bonkers that have stuck in your mind that you haven't written about or don't plan to write about? Probably. I mean, I keep a list on my phone of, uh, you know, things that might inspire something one day. I have one. Uh, right now it's not too crazy but it, it's about um, crows bringing gifts to like this little girl or it might be just one crow bringing her gifts she's created a relationship with this crow and i feel like there's something that could come out of that that could be pretty cool uh but yeah i don't know i'm always looking and trying to just play around with different ideas and see what see what happens um marcia asks uh what you do when you get writer's block I just try to push through it most of the time. Uh, I, don't, I don't really have any set thing that cures it. I mean, maybe take a break, try to get your mind off it for a few minutes. But I, I always, you know, kind of force myself to do it. Like I said, I work or I write every day. Uh, so even when it's a struggle, I, I just don't give up. Even if I have to, you know, sit at my desk till one, two, three in the morning, I, I always make sure that I hit my goal for the day. Uh, and eventually I get through it. I don't know. It's I didn't like hit my goal for the day. And now I'm like, I, really you're inspiring me to like, as soon as this is done, I'm like, so I got to get back writer, up. You're aren't you? You write in the morning? Or? Yeah, but I slept in today. So I'm, <laughs> I'm behind. So I feel like that would be tougher because, well, first off, I'm not a morning person. But, okay. Uh, I feel like if you're writing earlier, then of course you have to shut off because then you have to take care of other things during the day. I always write at night. So like, if I lose sleep, I lose sleep. I don't, I feel like I could just keep going. So. I admire that because if I lose sleep, I, I'm a zombie. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of a zombie. I'm always walking around. In the I'm always but I'm tired. inspired by your discipline. I'm very inspired by your discipline. Um, this is a really fun question. I'm excited to get to this one. It's a two-parter. So 
Lynette asks, if you could have a writing spot anywhere in the world, where would it be? So that could be a tough one too, because if you pick a place that's too incredible, I'm just going to be distracted by it. Uh, but, you know, there, there are those romantic notions of writing somewhere in Europe overlooking the Alps or something, you know, beautiful mountain view and, uh, you know, just peace and quiet and, you know, away from the city, something like that, maybe, if I'm being super romantic about it. <laughs> but realistically, um, I need to be in a room with windows shut, dra drapes closed, uh, you know, nothing distracting me because I could be distracted pretty easily. Yeah, I'm the same way. I didn't think of that when I read the question. I was like picturing myself <laughs> on the Amalfi Coast. Yeah. <laughs> like, anyway, but yeah, I would just be like, oh, what's going on? Oh, I'll have an espresso. Yeah. Like, I just would not be <laughs> focused at all. Yeah, same way. Like, can, can you write in a coffee shop? Or can, no. can you do that? I can't. No. I've never been able to write really anywhere other than home for the most part. Yeah, and I'm st I, I need to get better about it because I think I started off in Brooklyn and then I lived, I still lived in a city when I left New York, but now I live in the burbs. And for some reason it has made the distraction so much louder. Like mm. one truck comes down the street oh, and I'm like, what's going on? When before I could kind of tune it out. So yeah. yeah. Now, um, it's a, now it's a thing. If there's a truck, you know, it means something. Yeah, like it's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, think I, yeah, I saw that you were doing a live thing once and I think the delivery <laughs> delivery person came. <laughs> yeah, and I was just like, oh, is it for me? <laughs> I guess. Yeah. yeah, so it's bad. Um, but the second part of this question is, at any, would you go to any other time period in the past to write? Like hmm. if you could time travel. I don't know. I, I feel like this is a great time to write because of technology and everything. I always wonder like, what would it have been like to write an entire book on a typewriter? I don't know if I could, or even by hand, that seems just <laughs> terribly difficult. And then not having the internet as your uh, constant companion to answer questions as you're, you know, coming up with stuff and doing research. Uh, I don't know, I'm pretty happy, I think, writing now, but if I had to go back, maybe not too far back, 50s, 60s, uh, I don't know, some, some, somewhere in there. Yeah. Kind of romanticized. I, yeah. <laughs> this one too, I was like, I'd go back and I'd like, I think I was like, I'd go back to the nineties <laughs> just because I, could do that. I grew up in the nineties. So it's always like, I, I idealize the nineties, yeah. but yeah, without the internet and computers were like this oh, big. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, now's a good time. It is nice uh, to, like, sometimes just to be able to lie on the couch with the laptop and yeah. <laughs> actually, actually call that work. You know? Yes, 100%. <laughs> and to be able to like work, take your laptop and travel with it and work on trains yeah. or work in hotel rooms. And, right, yeah. Um, spell check is important oh, for yeah. me. <laughs> for sure. Spell check, grammar check. So no time like the present. Um, Bridget asks, what do you love most about the world of mystery and suspense and darkness? I love when I'm reading something and it just gets, gets my heart pumping. And usually that's when I start to feel really inspired. Uh, so maybe that's the true answer, the inspiration that, it, that, that I can take from it. But there's so many great novels and, and you know, I'm, I'm sure everyone can relate where you're reading it all of a sudden, uh, first off, you don't want to stop. Second, you feel your heart is racing, maybe your palms start sweating. And, and when you get into those moments, you know that you've come across something that's pretty unique and pretty amazing. So can you tell us at all about what's next for you? Now, I, I always struggle with this question because I don't know what I'm supposed to say and what I'm not mm. supposed to say. But uh, yeah, I do have a finished manuscript that I submitted earlier this month. It was due on the 1st. And uh, if all goes goes well with that, it should be the follow-up to Indian Burial Ground. And it will be the third in this sort of series that I've created. But it will follow the same kind of format where you'll get different main characters. And it'll answer a question from Indian Burial Ground that I left unanswered, just like 
Indian burial ground answers a couple of questions that I left unanswered from Sisters of the Lost Nation. So I've been having a really fun time creating that little world and kind of letting each book play off of the other one. Um, actually, this is kind of unrelated, but can I throw out a few things that I wanted to touch on or hopefully I hope. Yeah, yeah, we've got we've got um, 10 minutes left. So just want to say that there are some little Easter eggs that I planted within Indian Burial Ground and Sisters of the Lost Nation. So if anyone was a fan of Sisters, uh, I would say read carefully, see if you could put all the pieces together. Uh, also wanted to say that there are some characters that will reappear um, and also some characters in Indian Burial Ground who are in Sisters who you might not have even recognize when you read it. Uh, for instance, there's a character called Miss Doris in Indian Burial Ground, who's also one of my favorite characters. And uh, she makes an appearance in Sisters of the Lost Nation, but she's not named. So if anyone wants to go back and try to find her after you read Indian Burial Ground, because of course you'll have to get a sense of her character and what she's like to uh, identify her. But she does play a little part in there as well. And then uh, you might also come across some of your favorites from Sisters in Indian Burial Ground too. So keep an eye out for that. And I guess, since you asked about uh, what's next, I do introduce the characters for the next book in Indian Burial Ground, but they're just very briefly introduced and uh, I'll leave it to you to figure out which ones they are. Now I have to go back. To go back. I love a puzzle. <laughs> little, little pieces here and there. That's so fun. Is it, do you enjoy that, like, the shared universe? Yeah, I, I've, I've been really enjoying it. It wasn't the plan to do that, but it just kind of happened. And uh, so, yeah, that's the other thing as I'm writing, I'm constantly thinking, well, how can I link all of these together? What little pieces can I sprinkle here and there? Uh, and even though I don't know if there will be more books, I hope there will be, but I, I'm already thinking, like, well, if I plant something here, maybe I could play with that in the future because that might lead to another another mystery. So uh, I did that at least, I would say, twice uh, in Indian Burial Ground so that I had a little little wiggle room, some options in the future. Um, so there's the last few minutes, but we didn't get to our protagonists, Noemi mm -hmm. and Louis. Um, what was your favorite thing about those characters? And... What do you hope people take away from their time with them? Well, with with Noemi, or I've heard I've heard dual pronunciations. I say Noemi. Some people say Nomi, uh, but with Noemi, uh, she was a character, of course, that was in Sisters of the Lost Nation. She was this bratty little thirteen-year-old girl, uh, and then she's Louis's niece, and. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier, there are dual timelines in Indian burial grounds. So one timeline takes place uh, in the 1980s, 10 years before Sisters of the Lost Nation. Uh, and the other timeline takes place in present day, about 27 years after Sisters of the Lost Nation. So we have roughly a 40 year span there. And uh, with, with no Noemi, I, I think she's a really strong character. And I feel like she probably lived through a lot within those 40 years. Uh, from the time we first see her in the past timeline to the present. And so I wanted to just kind of explore her, her strengths a little. And I, I think I still haven't fully tapped into all of her strengths. And she's an, a character who I would love to revisit perhaps in the future. Uh, and then with, with Louis, uh, I think his strengths come out pretty early on, but he loses some of that throughout his life. He loses some of what he had picked up as a teenager uh and so that kind of fascinated me like how how can you be so strong as a, as a kid and then kind of weaken over time and uh we see in the present timeline he has to kind of find his old self again and, and part of that of course is related to the traumas that he faced those are the things that kind of brought him down a bit is there anything that you want readers to come away with when they, when they close the book like what's your hope for the takeaway? Well, I hope, of course, I hope they enjoy it, but I hope that uh, maybe it will inspire them to explore things that might be bothering them themselves. We all have things that we bury inside ourselves, uh, things that we hope will just go away, but when we do bury them and, and we don't give them the attention they deserve, those are the things that uh, might start to eat you up inside, might start to swallow you whole, as I say in the book, or which might resurface and come back from the dead. Uh, and 
uh, like I said earlier, sometimes the things that come back are not, you know, they're far uglier when, when we have to face them the second time than they were the first time around. So uh, maybe this will help some people with traumas of their own. Uh, I know writing for me and, and contemplating all this stuff tends to be pretty therapeutic. So maybe it'll be for others as well. There's a line in the book that reads, some nightmares transform you, some become part of you, some do both. And I think this book does both. I want to thank you for writing it. I want to thank you for hanging out with us all today. Um, I want to thank all the viewers who joined us. Um, for those of you who bought a ticket that included a signed copy of Indian Burial Ground, it will be delivered between eight to 10 business days. Um, extra copies of Indian Burial Ground are available 24 seven on bnn.com. Um, and also they're available at your local BNN stores. Definitely go out and pick it up if you haven't already ordered it. Um, and yeah, I just want to say thank you again. And thank you, Nick. Congratulations on another great novel. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you, Barnes & Noble. Thank you to everyone who came and so many questions. It was great hanging out with you. Uh, but thank you so much to Rachel. Thank you for doing this for me. I really appreciate it. Uh, make sure to go out, get Rachel's book as well. Pre-order <laughs> Uh, get all of her books pre-order <laughs> so thirsty right now to take advantage of the pre-order uh, sale and uh you won't be disappointed because of course everyone knows rachel writes the best stuff so thank you so much <laughs> i truly appreciate it and i had a really nice time hanging with you thanks everybody thanks nick thank you bye bye everyone <laughs>